Thank you for coming um, to Jason Phillips talking about practical nutrition application. Um, I've been a client of Jason's for a little over a year and a half. He has a variety of different kinds of clients from elite athletes to regular people like myself um, and even uh, people that have dietary restrictions, stuff like that. Um, he's a wealth of knowledge, so I really hope that everybody has some kind of question to contribute. Uh, without any further ado, was You're better. better. This, it was better this time. I was calmer this year. Yeah, it was better. Okay. Um, we did this last year. Katie didn't like that part as much, but um, so yeah. So thank you guys first of all for having me. I've picked up a little cold since being here the last two days. I live in Florida by way of Arizona, so I'm not quite used to this weather. So I apologize if you hear me sniffling. Um, that being said, quick little background on me. Not that it's super important, but I got my back, I got my way into nutrition and fitness a little bit differently than most people find their way into careers. Um, I was an anorexic at the age of 18 years old, um, walked around at 118 pounds. Um, that's not a very good look on a male, um, but it is what it is. Um, found myself in a pretty bad downward spiral. I actually credit the whole fitness and nutrition industry um, for bringing me out of that and actually helping me find my way building the businesses that I have today. Um, so I've been forever thankful for that and my goal has always been to pay it forward. Um, that's what brings me on stages like this. That's what takes me into the hundreds of gyms that I'm in every year and working with literally the thousands of clients that my businesses serve now. Um, so with that being said, um, I guess we're, he we're here talking about practical application and, and I think it's a pretty appropriate term in the sense that 90% of what you guys hear outside of walls like this is this is the way to diet, this is the way to train, this is like eliminate this, do this. And the reality is like all of it has some merit um, for probably one specific application. And uh, you know, everybody's gonna come in this room and every single person here is gonna have a separate set of needs. Um, there's not one dietary protocol in this world that serves each individual's needs in this room. Um, so my goal today is to educate you and teach you what you should be looking at in terms of setting up your own dietary protocol. What things in your lifestyle should you be observing? Uh, what things within you know, the way that you have a stress response, your activity level, uh, your previous dietary protocols, your training protocol, um, all of these things have to go into what you're going to do nutritionally to get the results that you desire. Um, now, I come to talks like this. Uh, I wasn't brought here because I'm an amazing public speaker, but because Katie claimed I'm a wealth of knowledge. Um, so I'm not gonna sit up here and lecture because that gets boring. Um, I don't ever bring slides, that's even more boring. Um, but what I wanna know is what do you wanna know? Um, I like to think that everybody attends something like this because they have a question in their mind. There's something you've heard in the media, there's something your friend told you, uh, there's something you're currently trying or have tried uh, that you're wondering why it doesn't work or why it does work. Um, so. Let's get those out of the way. Let's put them on the board, and then I have a really good base to talk to you about. Uh, so someone has to be really not awkward and break the ice. We have a microphone right over there, um, and I think there's handheld mics that can get passed around. Is this the one? Yeah, and they've got them up there. So someone's gotta be not awkward and go to the stand. And there's a couple. So for those of you guys that are watching on the live stream, I do have the dory pulled up, um, and there's two questions already on there. So, but someone in here has gotta be not awkward so we can get this moving. Maybe. Ooh, there we go. Awesome. <clears throat> What's your name? Thank, uh, ben Johnson. Nice to meet you. Thanks a lot for coming. Absolutely. Uh, joined Thank you. last time you were here, and it was excellent. Thank you for having me. So uh, red meat. Yeah. How much should I be eating? Can I get by not eating red meat? Like, is there a point where I'm eating way too much red meat, and it's bad for my heart? Like. Is, what, cool. are, what are like the rules around that? Yeah, cool. Thanks for coming, Jason. Thank uh, you. I'm Doug Weiner. Uh, I have questions around um, like flour, gluten, GMO, organics. Like where does that fit in with someone's diet and how do they want to sort of incorporate that and what are things to avoid, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So I'm going to break that down into two ways. Um, I'm going to say flour and gluten because that's kind of a hot topic, but I'm also going to say quantity versus quality because that's another hot topic in this space. Hey, I'm Mike. Uh, what do you consider healthy fats versus unhealthy fats if such a distinction exists? Hello. Uh, my on? name's Scott. Um, I Where recently, are you from? 
England. Awesome. What part? Uh, near Birmingham, a little okay. bit south. Yeah. I've been to the NEC. Oh yeah. Okay, you're right on it. Um, I've recently been doing spirulina as in a supplement. Uh huh. Um, what are the benefits for spirulina? So, I'm gonna go broad and say supplements, but then I'll put spirulina right. in the. Hi. Um, I was wondering if there's a difference between like a whole carb like brown rice versus like white rice with vegetables when you're balancing out kind of the fiber content of like a food on its own versus the fiber content of your meal and how that deals with glycemic load and things like that. So we're we talking glycemic index versus glycemic load versus fiber intake? Sure. Like, like, like does that kind of, that's like what yeah. I gathered, right? Like, like so yeah. first we said like a whole carb and then it was brown rice versus white yeah, so, rice and that's so, usually sorry. glycemic index. So, so I guess my question is, um, and I've always wondered like, there are certain foods that are high in fiber that mm -hmm. are low glycemic load yes. on their own, like as a food. Yes. Because of their fiber content or whatever. Yes. And then like, is that different in terms of how your body processes it? Um, from like eating a simple carb with lots of vegetables, which kind of lowers the glycemic load of the meal. Does this glycemic load change from an individual food to multiple foods? Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Is that, is that, is that what you're asking? I think so. Yeah. I think, I think that's think what so. I'm. I think that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> quick answer. Like I can answer that one right away. No. <laughs> like glycemic load is glycemic load, right? Like if it's let's put a numerical value on it and say 50. If it's 50 here, it's 50 here. Whether that came from white rice and asparagus or brown rice on its own. But like it's good that you're thinking glycemic load versus glycemic index, because glyce glycemic index is a lot of BS. Can we, can we talk about this? Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Sorry. <laughs> no, that was really good. I was just trying to make sure I answered the question appropriately. Thank you. That was a good question. Hi, yeah. I'm Tara. Hi. Uh, I feel like you hear a lot of different things about eat multiple small meals a day, keep your metabolism going versus like, I eat one meal a day. Like, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? And like constantly fueling your metabolism through lots of snacks. Yeah. Thanks, Katie. There's also been a lot of um, interest around different diets, specifically the Whole30 is one that I know has been really popular lately. I would love to hear your thoughts on, I don't know if I, oh, someone already mentioned that before I got here, but uh, your thoughts on different diets and whether that, uh, those diets are all basically fads and whether or not it, it makes sense to even pursue one or sure. change your whole eating lifestyle. Sure. I would also like to know what you feel about cleanses. <laughs> are you just like setting me up with that one? So when you're macro counting, uh -huh. say you have 135 carbs, 135 protein, and knowing that it's four grams per, you know, each of them. Can four you, calories per gram. Per calories, yeah. yeah. Can you mix that up, say, do a little bit more protein and a little less carbs? Mm -hmm. I want you to kind of elaborate on that so I understand if I can kind of play with that a little bit or I have to be kind of exact. Can you also explain what a macro is? I can. What's that? She's oh. just. Oh, yeah. Okay. I have a question yeah. about throwdown. About I want to know why is throw, throwdown, throwdown? Why is throwdown <laughs> better than some of these other stimulants that kind of get your heart going before workouts? So when we get to supplements, remind me that I know you don't like exists. to talk about your own, but I don't. I'm curious. I don't. So I'm putting you on the spot. Um, I'll happily explain why it's better than everything out there, but. <laughs> What else? So for anybody that walked in late, we're just kind of going through a few questions. Basically, the fact that it's far more fun to get answers to your own questions than it is to hear me talk about really boring food stuff. It's kind of what we're doing. Hi, it's me again. OK. This one's so nice. uh, What's your just stance overall on fruit? Because I've read a lot of things around how like fruit is bad now because it has sugar, which sounds crazy to me. So I want to hear from yeah. you what you think. Hi, Jason, Colin. How's it going? Do you have an opinion of Shakeology? <laughs> <laughs> have you heard of Shakeology? How, from... how, how far can I go without offending <laughs> okay, people? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, this is recorded, so I don't know if I can offend that many people. I would feel really bad if people are doing it. I mean, I'll tell you why it's crap, but... Hey, Jason Miranda. Hi, how um, are you? I was curious to hear your thoughts on dairy. Sure. In terms of? So I don't eat dairy okay. um, or meat, so why, I do. Why not? Just so I know which route I'm going down with oh, dairy. Yeah. Um, I did a January where I did a vegan diet. Felt okay. so much better in okay. general with everything. Kind was of that a 21 day it. jump start, perhaps? Mm, no, it was just a month with friends. We're okay. like, let's just try this out as a cleanse in January five okay. years ago. Um, and now that's my consistent diet. I, I eat fish though. So okay. curious to hear your thoughts on like what I should be considering, you know, if, if that's a no dairy diet is something that you're, yeah, doing. Pro or con, sure. Yeah. Sure. When I get to dairy, you might, I might have you remind me of some of those details so I won't remember all of that, but um, that's a really good question. A lot of good can come out of that. Hey, Jason, Gerard here. How's it going? Um, quick question on organic. Uh -huh. Like from a broad-based standpoint, sure. organic is kind of exploding. Uh -huh. Do you think that certain categories it's worth, worth more to pay more for organic or is it kind of all just uh, label reading? Mm-hmm. Hi, Victoria. I was Hi. wondering if you could kind of speak to what types of meals you should have pre-workout, post-workout, kind of aligning with like the macros and the uh, meal planning. Okay, I, maybe you want to write down the Dory questions on the board? Yeah. Um, oh, another one came in, I think. No. Um, all right, so on the Dory, we have, what is my stance on somebody ruining their metabolism due to malnutrition? What is the long-term effect of extended periods of under eating and or eating poorly? Oh, it just changed. Is it possible to do irreparable damage to the metabolism or is this a wives' tale? Um, for that person, uh, I'm gonna categorize that as metabolic adaptation. I'll explain that and that should answer your question. And do you want me to go over yours? Oh. It's on here. Yeah. Um, how does the effect of how does the effect on the body of mental stress compare to the stress of physically overtraining? Uh, I'm just going to categorize stress in general. Um, what are my thoughts on the blood type diet? For Googlers who haven't heard of this, I hadn't until another Googler told me about it. It's a nutritional philosophy that advocates a different diet for each of the four blood types. I'm gonna answer that really quickly. Um, it has zero merit. There's zero scientific basis to it. Um, so if you actually go and you read the peer reviewed studies, we've not proven that a blood type actually correlates with certain food intakes or intolerances. Um, as with anything, um, and as you'll kind of get to know by the end of today, if you feel good that way, um, great but you're gonna see that any specific food type is far inferior uh, to the total quantity of food consumed. So that's a quick answer to that one without going too deep into it. In all fairness, I haven't done tons of research, but I know empirically or um, evidence-based, it, it doesn't have any merit. So um, calorie spiking, I eat eating clean six days and boosting calories on day seven. What are your thoughts on the long-term uh, effectiveness of this? Seems to be very effective in hitting weight targets, but curious to see if it's really a sustainable lifestyle. Um, I've never heard it called calorie spiking, but I'll label it that way. All right, we got a lot this time. Yeah, um, and if anyone has questions, do, do we have more? As oh, yeah, as we go after this. Don't yeah, so this be this whole thing is hand. definitely meant to be interactive. So as we go, if I'm not explaining it in a way that resonates with you, um, by all means, tell me to shut up and ask more questions. Hey, Jason. Mike here. Thanks for uh, being here. This is Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Uh, so I've got two questions kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum. Sure. Uh, one is, do you have any thoughts on fasting, like uh, intermittent like fasting? Like intermittent or, fasting? Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. And the other, and I uh, really enjoyed the last talk you gave, uh, especially the conversation towards the end that we had about booze. Uh, alcohol. <laughs> that was a spirit. Man, I thought like we were going to get away without that question this time. I thought people were actually going to think I was really nice. Um, okay, cool. <sighs> Where do we start? Um, all right, I'm going to start with this one, quality versus quantity. 
Um, who brought that one up? That was on you, Ray? Yeah. Um, give me the specific really quickly. Well, uh, just as far as uh, my wife has been trying a bunch of different diets, specifically yes. Shakeology is one of the ones that Got came it. up. And so we've been looking at what are some food choice options for yeah. her in terms of um, what to pick. And then obviously organics and GMO foods are something that's obviously a very hot topic right now. So I'm just trying to navigate that a little bit to make recommendations. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, so quality versus quantity is the biggest debate, I think, in the nutritional industry right now. Um, I think if you've paid any attention to what the literature suggests in the last five or six years, and when I say literature, I mean media, um, the media is trying to get you to believe that you need to be paleo or you need to do Whole30, um, and, and it all needs to be quality emphasis. And, and I think that's great. I think that for the first time as a culture, our awareness of what we're actually consuming is at its peak. Um, the problem is I think that we've traded an awareness of quantity for quality exclusively, and they're not mutually exclusive. Um, so to use an example, I think we could all in this room agree that like chicken and broccoli or, or salmon and asparagus, they're, they're both relatively healthy meals. Um, the problem becomes if you eat 500 calories of chicken and broccoli, you're going to starve um, and you're going to end up in metabolic adaptation. You're going to find out what that is later today. Um, if you eat 5,000 calories of chicken and broccoli, you're going to be fat. Right? It's just, it's factual. There's, it, there are numbers, like your body, it, it always comes down to calories. Um, so when we get into quality versus quantity, it's, it's really clear in terms of metabolism that quantity is number one, but I would argue that quality is 1A. Um, I believe the gap has closed a lot in our awareness, um, but to, to sit here and say, well, Shakeology works. If you look at somebody that had a prior diet to Shakeology, you're probably talking about somebody over consuming calories, right? Three, 4,000 calories as, as somebody with a BMR around 2,000. Well, all of a sudden you put them on Shakeology and they're restricted to, I don't know what it is truthfully, but it's like three shakes a day and like a meal or some, something like that. It, they're probably coming down to like 1,500 calories. There was nothing magical about those shakes except for the BS that they're selling you and their $100 shakes, right? And the 30 people getting paid on it. Right? But what happened is the calories came down. And as the calories came down, well, what happens? Now you're in a calorie deficit. Your body's going to spit off you know, energy. It's actually going to burn fat. Well, that's fat loss. You could have done that without the shakes. Right? You could have done that with whole foods across the board. And you probably could have gotten more micronutrients. So I think that's like the, the big debate here in terms of paleo. Right? In an athletic setting, like if I were to be in a CrossFit gym today, I would be bashing paleo. Because there's big problems with paleo. Right? There's, there's no quality control over, over that diet. And somebody asked Whole30, who was that? Whole30, right? That's the biggest problem with Whole30. There's no quantity control. So they're telling you, don't eat this, don't eat that, eat this, eat that. But how much, right? Oh, we'll put half your plate protein, like a tiny portion carbohydrate. But how does that, like, if you and I were to do that, right, and 5% of your plate's carbs and 5% is mine, I don't know what you're doing after work today. I don't know if you're going to train. That diet doesn't know if I'm going to train. I don't know the intensity at which you train. They don't know the intensity at which I train. I don't know your life stress. I don't know your metabolic history, right? So every diet has to start with some sort of previous background on the individual. So I think the concepts of, of Whole30 I think the concepts of food quality are fantastic, but I think that they're missed by not addressing quantity first. And I actually think, right, like mark my words, I'm glad this is being recorded. I think in five to six years, you'll see a really big diet fad come out that merges these two together. Somebody will hack the way to put that out there and will say, well, these are the foods you should eat, but this is how you should figure out your quantity. I'm not sure how it's being done because, again, an individual recall is, is needed. Um, and all these you know, macro calculators on the internet are, are the worst things to ever hit the internet. Um, but does that, does that answer both questions? Does that answer the whole 30 uh, question? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, testing. So what I'm thinking about now is you know, in context of my wife, uh, she did Shakeology, she lost a bunch of weight, sure. she went off Shakeology, she gained some weight back, yep. you know, it, it just happened. So, and I'm just trying to figure out without, obviously working with someone like yourself would be the best way to go to take all of those inputs that you just said in, into consideration to, to, to uh, design a diet plan to sure. address that. But I'm just thinking in my head, like, what's it, like an easy approach mm -hmm. to try and do, I guess, a calorie deficit yeah. environment? So, so for sure, right? So. The, the first thing I would recommend to everybody, right? If you take nothing else away from today, but this next statement, this is the single most important thing to take away. Go home, track your food intake for five days. Like, 
99% of people do not have an awareness of what they currently take in. So right now, the situation you just explained is Shakeology, not Shakeology. Right? I don't know what this number of calories and macros is. I don't know what the number of this calories and macros is. I guarantee you there's a very big discrepancy, and that's the singular reason for the weight loss and regain. So let's create an awareness here, minus Shakeology. Right? Let's call it 3,000 calorie baseline. It's probably not, but let's use semantics. Right? Like let's just let's sit here and have a baseline, hypotheticals. Okay? Let's create a deficit from that. Let's go in, let's spend 20 minutes at night, and let's build a plan. Let's say 20% caloric reduction, 15%, right? 450 calorie reduction. Great, make a meal plan that's sustainable to you with 25, 50 calories, right? Simple. Now adhere to that for a couple weeks. Did you lose weight? Great, it wasn't the shakes that did it. See how it becomes relatively simple? But first, you have to have awareness. Almost every single person operates without awareness. Like, I don't know the types of problems you guys encounter here at Google, right? When my head goes to IT, it's like, okay, I have a computer issue. They're not going to get on and start telling you things to fix before they ask you what the problem is. Well, we need to address what the problem and what the current need state of an individual is. Everybody should know their need state. Make sense? Does that answer the question better? Absolutely. Awesome. Um, so as we dig into that, right, we're going to dig into things like the whole flour gluten argument and then the dairy thing. So the dietary trends I talked about are the whole 30s. They are the paleo diets of the world. And forgive me if I'm wrong because I don't read a lot of whole 30 because it is such crap. Um, they tell you not to have gluten and dairy, right? Like I'm, I'm pretty sure those are two things that are not allowed. Awesome. So for 25, 30 years, you had gluten and dairy. It never gave you bloating. It never, like, well, didn't mess up your skin. You really didn't have any issues with it. You lived fine. You had energy. You know, some book and some group of people just told you it was the devil, so you cut it out. Great. You cut it out for a year. You really didn't like the results of it. Then you go back and you try to put dairy in or you try to put gluten in. All of a sudden, you have dairy and you're running to the toilet. But for 25 or 30 years, it didn't affect you. Why after this one year is it, not, is it basically affecting you? What happens is when you stop consuming something, the enzymes responsible for processing it, they downregulate. You're not consuming it, those enzymes don't need to be active, right? They're gone. The problem is those are what's called non-resilient enzymes. So when you go to put it back in, they may never come back. So a large segment of our population that is complaining about dairy and gluten right now probably created their own lactose and gluten intolerance. Thank you, Paleo and Whole30. Because that's what we're getting from that. So the people that are cutting those things out of their diet, they better be ready to do it for life. Any dietary change you make, you better be ready to do it for life. If you're not, don't make it. No diet, I don't care if it's sustainable for a year. If it's not sustainable for the next 50 years, 100 years, however long we're alive, don't do it. Make sense? Somebody that asked about dairy. Does that make sense? Does that answer some of the question that you had? So there's, there's no research that says dairy is good or bad, right? I mean, a lot of dairy has live active cultures. There's great probiotics in it. There's no reason not to consume it. Um, I think a lot of what paleo and Whole30 on is founded on very specific applications, right? Rob Wolf is a super smart dude. He brought the paleo diet to the forefront. He also brought the paleo diet to the forefront in the sense that he said, hey, this is, a great this is a great diet for autoimmune application. So if you have an autoimmune disease, perhaps you should stick to paleo-friendly foods. You should not consume dairy. If you don't have it, why are we living in a diet specialized for that population? It doesn't make much sense to me. At the risk of potentially, like, I would hate to eliminate dairy for a year, and then you're telling me for the rest of my life I can't have desserts that have dairy in them. No thanks. That's not a very good quality of life for me. Yeah, I think there's just a lot of research around the Mediterranean diet mm -hmm. and vegan diets and, oh, it's good for your heart. And there's a lot of, I mean, there's a ton of different books out there. You can read. So remember that, remember, that books are, remember that books are written to sell, first and foremost. Right? I wrote a book. I sold it. Made some money on it. Great. A lot of times, publishers will go to them and be like, how can you frame this to sell? And when you start looking into, if you actually dug into the studies and you looked at the limitations of the application of the study cited in those books, the best one I can think of is carb backloading. I'll address that in a second. You start seeing it was a very selective population. It was a very small sample size. And it really hasn't been tested year in, year out. 
Now, also remember, those people were largely unhealthy before they got on this diet. So was it that specific dietary change that, that created that next level of health? Possibly. Was it exclusively that? We don't know. So there's a lot of ambiguity in the space. My question, my, my answer to you would be this. If you feel really good off dairy and that's sustainable for you for the rest of your life, absolutely do it. If you don't feel like that's sustainable for you the rest of your life and it's not a single thing holding you back from that next level, don't start there. See how there's always like an if, right? And that's, that's the one thing that's the hardest part about doing seminars like this is I would love to be like, yeah, there's a definitive answer. 99% of the stuff we'll talk about today, there's no definitive answer. It's what's gonna suit you long term. Does that make sense? The enzymes kind of, as they relate to sugar too, so um, when you start to reduce your sugar intake, like over what time mm -hmm. horizon does your body Yeah, so sugars start to would be less, less about, sugars would be less about enzymatic production and more about blood sugar regulation, right? And so the extreme example of that would be going super low carbohydrate into a ketogenic state, right? You're basically lower, you're, you're basically decreasing your insulin sensitivity long term, right? Because you're living in a state of ketosis, you don't really have to learn how to take in carbohydrates. So if you decrease carbohydrate intake for a super long time, and you, especially the female population, you decrease insulin sensitivity, you're actually gonna have a really hard time reintroducing carbohydrates. It has to be done in a, a systemized way, right? Um, that's why you see a lot of females, specifically, um, whose metabolisms are very less resilient than males. It's just unfortunate it's the way it is. Um, they have a hard time going low carb to back to normal calorie, normal carbohydrate intake, um, especially if that low carb or ketogenic state was prolonged. Um, so all these diets out there that are like, well, go super low carb for you know, three months and then we're gonna go through this um, you know, carb reintroduction stage. I was just in uh, Louisiana and they had one called the ideal protein diet or something like that. And they were telling me about that, right? Where it's all this protein and then you know, at some week you reintroduce carbs. For the male population, great. Male metabolisms, male hormone profiles, they're built for that. That's not an issue. Females, you're not. Females have a greater degree of metabolic adaptation faster. It just is what it is. There's statistics around it. We don't know why internally. Does that make sense though? So it's not really an enzymatic thing. It's an insulin sensitivity thing. Um, so reducing sugar, assuming carbohydrate intake stays normal, fantastic idea. Right? Now we're reducing inflammation, now we're reducing, we're, we're keeping blood sugar more stable for a prolonged period of time. When blood sugar is stable, energy levels are higher. Um, you also have less propensity to store fat. That's a great idea. So if we're reducing sugar intake, keeping carbohydrate intake high, or keeping it moderate or relative to where it was, awesome idea. Reducing sugar intake plus reducing overall carb intake, not a great idea. Make sense? Question came up on the dory that had to do with this. What if you have cut something out for several months? Are you basically out of luck to reintroduce it? How long does it take to totally lose those enzymes and never be able to get them back? The question on the duration is I don't know. It's gonna be relative to each individual. Um, but let me reiterate that I was specifically talking about gluten and dairy. Um, dairy and gluten are the, the non-resilient enzymes. Um, let's say you cut it out for other food groups um, or other types of things. Um, the, the literature super, isn't super clear. Um, as to you know, the, the rate at which it's gonna come back, if you can get it back. And even on gluten and dairy, not everybody is gonna be non-resilient forever. Some people are gonna get those back. Um, but just being aware of the fact that they are non-resilient, some population will never get them back. Um, that's, the, that's the takeaway of what I was trying to get out there. Hopefully that answers your question, anonymous. Um, <laughs> On that, we'll go to glycemic index versus glycemic load. Um, so obviously we've, uh, you know, I think 10, 11 years ago, um, glycemic index was super hot. They said, you know, gotta eat brown rice, can't have white rice, gotta eat sweet potatoes, can't have white potatoes, gotta eat oatmeal, can't have cereal, uh, et cetera. Um, I'm sorry, that's complete BS. Uh, the reality is a calorie is a calorie, a carb is a carb. Um, it might impact your insulin a different way. Um, that is the truth. Um, but we have to know what the outcome we're talking about is if we're, talk if we're even talking about it. Um, you know, there's uh, this whole popular movement of if it fits your macros, flexible dieting application. It all actually started um, in the bodybuilding community. And so remember that the bodybuilding community has one goal, and that's to look really good on a specific date on a stage. They don't get tested for health markers when they're on stage. We don't look internally. We don't do blood work. We don't ask them how they feel. We judge them strictly on aesthetics. So in terms of glycemic index, in terms of sugar versus fibrous carbohydrate, a carb is a carb in terms of aesthetics. 
Now we get into the health side of things. It's completely different. Insulin response matters. We don't want a super high insulin response. You're gonna feel like crap. Energy levels are gonna go real high. They're gonna crash. You're gonna feel real bad, right? They're gonna be all over the place all day. That's where some of that fatigue comes from. But when we're looking at glycemic index versus glycemic load, how many people in here, show of hands, eat a bowl of white rice by itself or a bowl of brown rice by itself on a regular basis? Those of you guys that can't see the room, that's zero, okay? You're always gonna pair that with a food. You know, white rice with steak, you know, brown rice with chicken, whatever, right? Sweet potatoes with some sort of meat. Or if you're a vegan, even, you know, with another carbohydrate. That's going to change the overall impact of that food on your body, and that's what's known as glycemic load. So earlier we referenced glycemic load of two paired foods versus one food by itself is the same, right? The number is the number. Um, so if we were to even be taken into account some sort of glycemic variable, index or load, we should take into account the glycemic load. But even that is gonna be secondary to what we first talked about, which is the quantity of the food. The overall quantity of the macros relative to the overall calorie intake for the day. Does that make sense? Yes, a macro. Um, I should have started there, I apologize. Um, so, that's actually really good. Um, I don't know why I didn't do that. Um, macronutrient, it's a protein, a carbohydrate, or a fat. Um, so when we start and we look at any dietary protocol, I mentioned earlier to this gentleman, um, Shakeology versus non-Shakeology, total calorie intake versus a lower calorie intake. Um, it's one thing, you know, I, I explained in that, it's calorie control that determines weight gain or weight loss. Um, that's always how it's gonna be. However, when we're looking at fat loss, we're looking at composition of those calories that we're now controlling. Perfect example of that is the McDonald's study. I think I said that last time I was here. There's a guy out there, he said, I'm gonna lose weight, I'm gonna eat nothing but McDonald's in a calorie controlled manner. He ate nothing but McDonald's in a calorie deficit, he successfully lost weight. They looked at the body composition that he lost, he lost muscle and kept body fat. So when you put two and two together, he lost weight but he got fatter. Is that anybody's goal? Okay, good. So, when we look at two things, we try to create a calorie deficit. We try to create a calorie deficit with an appropriate macronutrient composition. Because I don't know anybody that wants to lose muscle and gain fat. And if so, that's cool. We can have another conversation. Um, or we can take you somewhere else. Um, but, so that's what a macro is, and that's why we worry about macro composition. In fact, every single client I work with, um, I don't even tell them their calories, because what I get is I get the, uh, the macro manipulation game. So they come to me and they're like, oh, I can have 2,500 calories, um, cool, I wanted cake tonight, so instead of all that protein you told me to eat, um, I had more calories from carbohydrates and fat. Cool, um, you're gonna be like that McDonald's dude. So macro manipulation doesn't work out long term. Um, on that, we'll go to the, the protein, carbohydrate, the calorie balance. Um, the, the biggest thing when you're in a calorie deficit is understanding there has to be enough dietary protein, right? So when you're in a calorie deficit, the single goal of any dietary phase is preserve the lean muscle tissue, strip the body fat, right? That's what we're after, we're trying to get leaner. Um, the, the, lean, the lean muscle tissue is actually your most metabolically active tissue at rest. So the more lean tissue you have, the more calories you're burning at rest. We don't want to put ourselves in a position where we're gonna lose that. So that's where protein intake comes into play. You have proteins and you have protein sparing nutrients. When the protein sparing nutrients are lower, i.e. carbs and fats being lower, the need for protein goes up. So when you're a calorie deficit, your protein intake's always gonna be at its highest. Take somebody that's trying to gain weight, now we could potentially bring that protein down and bring the carbs and fats up because they're already in a calorie surplus. There's really no need to worry about sparing that protein. You have plenty of calories to go there. Does that make sense? So are they interchangeable? The answer is no. Make sense? From a calorie perspective, you might still see the same result on the scale, but you're not gonna see the same result in the mirror. And I have never... Protein. Correct. Well, if, if carbs come down, or, so you're talking about if carbs come down and proteins go up. The problem there, in, in some instances, that's fantastic, right? Assuming a normal functioning metabolism. And so I'm sitting here knowing our work together. Assuming metabolically adapted, no, that's not gonna work because carbohydrates are the, have the most impact on the metabolism, 
right? Meaning, so if somebody has a previously non-functioning metabolism, we have to have carbohydrate intake to spike those metabolic hormones, that leptin, that ghrelin, that T4 to T3 conversion. Um, and so if we're actively reducing carbohydrates in favor of protein, um, you will eventually create glucose in your body, um, but in a very non-efficient metabolically way, or metabolic pathway. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so within that, so the meal frequency, um, how many times you eat a day does not matter. Um, there is actually more and more evidence coming out that a less frequent meal schedule is actually better in terms of muscle gain and fat loss. Um, now, does that mean we should go to intermittent fasting? And the answer is no. There's absolutely nothing magical about intermittent fasting. I have one time that I will give somebody an intermittent fasting protocol, and that's if we're seeing really poor digestion. Um, there are studies that show an uptick in digestion um, and ability to digest based on a prolonged fasting period. Um, so that's really where that application comes in. In terms of fat loss, there's zero research that supports it, especially in terms of maintaining lean tissue or adding lean tissue. There's actually research that supports it's awful um, and that it should never be used in that protocol. Um, so a certain website out there, Lean Gains, um, is completely full of crap. So, and that's just evidence-based, like the science is out there. So that's not conjecture. Um, however, this being said, if you look at intermittent fasting, like I said it, with, the, when, with our argument on the Shakeology, you see a lot of people, if I told you, and you're not aware of what your caloric intake is now, that your feeding window is shortened to five hours versus 12 hours, you're gonna consume less calories. Well, why did you lose fat? Not because of any fasting protocol, but because you ate less food. If I told you that you had to put all those calories in that same window, nothing's gonna be different. So if it's more convenient for you to eat five to six hours, if it's mentally more controllable to keep your calories under control by limiting them to a five to six hour window, there's no risk for any issues, assuming you're not starving yourself. And if that's what's gonna lead you to compliance, then I would encourage you to do it. At the end of the day, it's whatever is going to yield compliance. Whatever's gonna allow you to, to comply to a successful setup for yourself long-term. That's what's gonna matter. But I think that everybody looks at, well, should I do intermittent fasting? Should I do carb cycling? Should I do carb backloading? Should I do paleo? Should I do Whole30? None of them matter unless it's something that you can stick to long-term and unless the application is to you specifically. Does so that answer the intermittent fasting question? Yeah? Uh, meal frequency, who had that one? I feel like there was a little, was a little more in-depth. Does that answer the question? Yeah. So there's, there's definitely no reason. So the, the whole reason on meal frequency, right, that you say you got to eat every three hours to keep the metabolism elevated, like that was the whole crux behind it. Um, they've actually found that that's completely false, and there's so much science coming out now to back that up. Um, along those same lines would be, well, don't eat carbs after 6 o'clock. Um, I would actually argue flip the script, eat all your carbs after 6 o'clock. That would, like, if I had to give you one option, all your carbs before six, all your carbs after six, I would take after six. Um, there's a significant evidence on basically the stimulation of the metabolism, the thermic effect of having that feeding at night on actually having the metabolism elevated later in the day through the evening. Also getting an insulin response at night, right? Getting a big insulin response from the carbohydrate feeding. Think about what happens, insulin's here. After that, it comes back down, right? It falls. When insulin levels are low, cortisol levels increase, HGH levels increase. With high cortisol, with our ability to wake up with a normalized cortisol curve, with our ability to wake up with elevated HGH levels, guess what we're using at that time? Elevated cortisol equals mobilization of fat. Make sense? In general, would you say there's a certain period at night you should eat after? No. No. I think last time I was here, I said I got into bed with a with a skinny cow ice cream sandwich. <laughs> and I lost my man card, so I never said it again. Did you? Just make sure that you're repeating questions if they don't have oh, the mic. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, For no frequency, I hear less about keeping your metabolism high and more about keeping your blood sugar levels mm -hmm. less package. You're less likely to snack and break some kind of stay on target. Is there a truth to that? So the question is, in reference to uh, meal frequency, it's not so much about metabolic rate being elevated, but in terms of blood sugar uh, being stabilized. I would actually say there is some truth to that. Um, you know, but again, if you're, 
that's going to come down to eating the right amount of food throughout the course of the day, right? Like if you wake up and you have, you're like, all my carbs are going to be at breakfast, that's probably going to necessitate another meal in three to four hours because obviously your blood sugar levels are going to be all over the place, right? You're going to get a really high insulin spike. It's going to come back down. You're going to feel like crap. You wake up, you have a balanced meal. Um, there's no set intervals that are going to keep that blood sugar more stabilized. It's really going to come down to metabolic rate, overall calories being taken in. Um, does that make sense? Right, because if you only had 500 calories for breakfast and you're consuming 5,000 calories in a day, absolutely your blood sugar is going to start to drop in an hour, hour and a half. And yes, that would be an appropriate time to eat. But relative to fat burning, um, it's not going to do anything more beneficial or less beneficial. Um, that comes down to energy and, and like you said, mental clarity, focus, things like that. And absolutely keeping blood sugar levels stable all day, um, 100%. And that's where, that's where I would look into meal frequency. Make sense? Does that answer your question on meal frequency? Um, the best tool I can give anybody in terms of meal frequency, eat at the times it's gonna, gonna be most consistent day to day. So one of the questions I ask a client right away is how many times can you routinely commit to eating every day? Is it three, is it two, is it five, is it 10? If you want to eat five times every single day, great, commit to those five times. Why, because when you travel, you're gonna say to me, well how do I count when I travel? Well I really don't want you to count when you travel, but can you eat at those same five times the approximate things that you'd be eating when you're at home? Right? If you're waking up and you're having like eggs and oatmeal, great. When you're out at a hotel, when I'm on the road 200 plus days a year, I can find eggs and oatmeal in a hotel because that's what I'm used to eating at home. At lunch, I can find some sort of protein carbohydrate combo. I eat four times every single day. I know how to find that everywhere I go. That's how I'm able to maintain my shape everywhere I go. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of deeper things that you have to go into into individual application there. Um, but the, the science, the evidence supports that there's no increased fat loss in terms of meal frequency. The question is, are you supposed to be hungry in the morning? The answer is yes. Um, hunger is a very good sign of metabolism, of metabolic activity. Um, so people that are like, oh, I'm hungry, good, right? If you actually came to me and you said, I'm not hungry, I'd be scared. Um, it's usually indicative that you're not eating enough. Um, mind you, if you're eating like 10,000 calories a day, that's not the case. But most people that come to me that um, complain of lack of results and they're not hungry, it's very indicative that they're overstressed and not eating enough. Um, so hunger is a very good physiological response. So, um, I, so you said you mentioned eating carbs late at night. Yes. Like yes. So if I work out first thing in the morning, yes. I usually try to have most of my carbs in the morning. Yep. And then kind of taper it off over mm -hmm. the day. Uh, so what, do you, what, what time do you work out in the morning? 7.30. Do you eat before you go to the gym? Yeah. Okay, what do you think your pre-workout meal is? Um, what do you think your pre-workout meal is? Where do you think your body's getting fuel? For, uh, oh, for my the dinner the night before. Okay, so that would be another really good reason to have carbohydrates at night. Make sense? Yeah. Your body's always gonna go back to the last thing it had. In fact, like a lot of people in here, or in general, are like, oh, I'm going to the gym and have a protein bar, or I'm gonna have a banana, or I'm gonna have this or that to, to get me fueled, right? Unless you're using like a super carb, a high molecular weight carb, you're really not getting usable fuel for four to five hours out of your food. Um, so, you know, it's one of those types of situations where your body's, you know, you definitely should be having more carbs at night. However, what you're doing in the morning and having carbs post-workout, fantastic, right? So for you to, to maximize your day, to maximize blood sugar regulation, I'd be stacking your carbs in the morning, stacking them at night, more of your proteins and fats and vegetables throughout the day. It'd make a lot of sense. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, any other questions on meal frequency or, or meal timing relative to different types of day? Cool. Um, what is a macro? We did that one. Healthy fats. Who asked that one? What was the question again? Uh, so most of what I hear is like, you know, the one eating of the fat is evil. You know, fat's good now. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, fats are like the best thing in the world if you look at the media. <laughs> uh, but a lot of the other things down to like, you know, like healthy fats, like whole fat, uh, dairy, avocado, olive oil, most animal protein. Yeah. I'm not really clear like what the bad fats are. So, if I'm cooking at home, I, as long as I'm not getting like, fried crap. Correct. Yeah, and, and that's honestly, 
it, like the oversimplification of what you just said, and I know that wasn't heard, but I don't know how to restate that whole thing. Basically, he said like animal fats, like oils, nuts, like where, like how do we draw the line between good and bad fat? And he said, you know, as long as he's not eating fried crap, like is he not eating bad fat? And that's very oversimplified, but the answer is yes. If we were to go even deeper and we were to look at like inflammatory response, anti-inflammatory response, right? You've got omega-369. Those are the three that we really look at. Um, the problem is that the Western diet is very high in omega-6, as it's lower in omega-3. Omega-6 is pro-inflammatory, omega-3 is anti-inflammatory. So we deal with a population that's very inflamed because our diets are rich in omega-6. So the reason everyone's big on this whole take in healthy fat thing, what they're really saying is get more omega-3s, increase your ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. That can be done through supplementation, that can be done through things like coconut oil that are a medium chain triglyceride that supposedly provide energy for fat burning. That's, eh, that's really skewed science. Um, but the, the better statement would be get more omega-3s in your diet. Does that make sense? That's really what people are pushing you towards. But again, that explanation, that's not super sexy, right? So people are gonna be like, well, just eat your fat because everyone loves bacon. What are examples of omega-3s and omega-6s? Uh, omega-6 primarily found in chicken. Right, that's the one big mistake that everyone's making. Um, like salmon's really good omega-3, omega-9. Omega-3 eggs are a really good source. Um, it's not so much that we have a hard time finding omega-3s, because usually when you're getting omega-6s, you are getting some omega-3s. It's that we're eating, we're over-consuming things like chicken that are super high in omega-6, void of omega-3. Um, but supplementing with things like fish oil is obviously very beneficial, because you're gonna get a high ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. Go ahead, she's got the mic so that they can hear you. Chicken high in omega-6 because yes. of the farming no. quality or just no. because of that's naturally how In it general, is? just the naturally occurring fats. Yeah. Um, the farming quality has nothing to do with the fact that it's primarily omega-6. Yeah. Does that make sense? Does that make sense on the fats? Um, we've got, by time standards, like seven minutes. I think a lot of people are prepared to stay 30 minutes after. So. Um, I just want to make sure that I try to cover everything. Is there anyone that has to leave that's time sensitive with their question on the board? Okay, cool. Um, so, cleanses. Um, yeah, I mean, I could go on for days, right? Cleanses are an absolute way to go about things, right? It's, it's basically, you're not gonna stay on a cleanse. Like, one statement I made earlier is something you should be doing, should be something you're prepared to do forever. Cleanses are never a way to achieve anything. They're super low calorie by nature. Um, you know, recently I think that they're done with like green shakes and they're very micronutrient rich, which I think is great. Um, but it implies a, an extreme calorie deficit, which is usually going to yield rapid weight loss, but that's never sustainable. So you get people that go on cleanses, they lose 10, 18 pounds. They're like, oh, this is the best thing in the world. Then the weight comes back on inevitably. You cannot sustain five to 800 calories, reintroduce those calories and expect yourself to not gain weight. Um, I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you've gone on like a three week bender. You should not come back and go on a cleanse. A, from a psychological perspective, and 90% of dietary compliance is psychological, you're teaching yourself that it's okay to drastically mess up because hey, there's this fix right afterwards. That's a really bad feedback loop to get into long term. Right, so if you do go on a three week bender, come home and get back on track. It's the best thing you can do. But to use a cleanse is the worst thing you can possibly do. Now. People are like, what about like a liver cleanse or, or something to help like your gallbladder? If you have borderline diseased liver, if you've got like kidney stones or you've got problems somewhere physiologically, perhaps look into a cleansing protocol to help with that. But that's completely different than saying, I'm gonna go on the latest juice cleanse to lose 20 pounds. Does that answer that question? Anyone not gonna do a cleanse, please? Um, Sorry if anybody does isogenics. Why the cleanse isn't about fat loss and it's about digestive function? Give me an example. The question is, what if it's about digestive function, not fat loss? Um, my girlfriend went through a candida cleanse. And uh -huh. She's not fat. But she did it so... But she potentially had candida? Uh, I think she's read it a few too many things. Um, but she just put herself through like a prolonged cleanse period, and it was solely for digestive purposes. Sure. If you potentially have candida, yeah. and you think that your borderline, you know, your GI is messed up because of it, that would be one of those, sci like, the physiological applications that I think would apply, okay. right? Because you're trying to fix something internally that's physiologically messed up. Does that make sense? Yeah, it it's not about weight loss, and largely those cleanses, right? 
largely they're taking out like lots of different food groups that potentially can create an environment for candida to feast off of. But they're also not super low calorie. Right? A lot of those are still involving what you would need to survive. And you're also not coming out of that being like, I'm down 15 pounds. Oh, crap, I gained five pounds the next week, and you freak out. Because that was never the mentality going into it. So yeah, I would say that's super appropriate. I would have absolutely zero issues with it. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, OK. So moving with that, going into supplements. Um, Supplements are exactly what they say they are. Um, they're a supplement to an already good diet. Anybody that comes to me that says, OK, awesome, all that macro stuff is really good, all that timing stuff is really good, um, but what about, what about this fat burner? Is that going to help expedite things? I get really, really worried. Um, problem, the chances are they're not going to follow the diet. They think that by taking that fat burner in the morning that it's going to expedite the results. It never is. Um, are there some supplements that can actually help with quality of life? Absolutely. Um, as somebody that owns a company that works with thousands of people at this point, you know, I think things like taking vitamin D are very essential. You know, if you were, if everybody in here, especially being in Chicago, were to go and get a 25 OHD, which is a blood test to measure vitamin D levels, I bet you 95% of us would come back low or subclinical. Now, vitamin D is so powerful, it could be classified as a steroid. It's a precursor to hormone function. Obviously, it's going to help regulate mood. Um, there's a host of benefits of having adequate vitamin D levels in your life. So I absolutely recommend with supplementing something like vitamin D. A lot of us are low in magnesium. Magnesium helps us recover from day-to-day -day work, day-to-day -day stress. It's a precursor to neurotransmitters. It's going to help us sleep. So I'd recommend supplementing with magnesium. Those of you guys that are resistance training, I think branched-chain amino acids are a fantastic supplement. But the reality is supplements are not needed. For us to survive, for us to thrive, we absolutely can get away by eating the right types of foods, the right quantity of foods, the right quality within that quantity, and never need a supplement. So you asked the question about spirulina. Is that going to help? It's going to get you more antioxidants. It's going to get you more micronutrients. Do I think that creating a more neutral, less acidic environment in your body is a good thing? 100%, right? We know that cancers, diseases, they thrive in an acidic environment. So if we can keep you more neutral or more on the base side, great, right? The water I walked in with today, it's 9.5 pH. I think that's a fantastic way of going about it. Is it essential to survival? No. Does it help if you have some extra money to invest in? Sure. But remember, supplements cost money above the food. And if you're going to spend money on either side, spend on the food. Get really high quality food. Eat the right amounts of your food. I see 95% of problems resolved in and of that. So then the question is throw down, right? And you know, of course, I'll talk about it. You know, the, the reality is nobody in here is probably going to benefit from it. How many people in here do CrossFit? Like one, two, right? How many people in here do aerobic activity? Okay, so a decent amount. So what's in Throwdown, right? Like the typical pre-workout product, and this is for everyone that trains, if you're going to take a typical pre-workout, it was designed to enhance energy, right? So they put a stimulant in there, lots of caffeine. Back in the day, ephedra was borderline legal, but there was things like synephrine or, or citrus or antium that were really popular that would mimic ephedra. Um, so they'd put high doses of that. And then they would put a vasodilator in there. What a vasodilator is, is it increases blood flow to the working muscle, um, enhances that pump, enhances that vascularity, um, you know, makes you look bigger at the moment that you're training that muscle group. Um, feels really good, right? As that progressed, they started putting like mental components in it, DMAE. It was a European party drug. They figured out that it made you have that euphoric feel, and they actually put that into American supplements. Um, shocker, people started dying, and it's now illegal. Um, so then you go over, and you know, we created our product to be basically the opposite of that. We deal with a population that does not want blood flow to the working muscle because it's going to help you fatigue faster. Right? Remember, in the gym, if you're doing bicep curls, who cares if you fatigue at 8 or 12? Your biceps are bigger. That's what matters. In a performance setting, if you're fatiguing earlier and you can't go later in the rounds or later in your endurance ride or whatever it may be, right? your performance sucks, you lose. We created a product that delays the onset of fatigue and delays, like, it helps enhance that muscular endurance. Right? Also gives you the ability to breathe at higher heart rates. So as you go closer to red line, you can breathe later in that giving you that extra potential five reps, right, before you put the bar down and someone else puts the bar down first. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, other ingredients, cordyceps, citrulline, there's really good studies on both. Um, that's really what it comes down to. That's the difference between throwdown and other pre-workouts out there. Um, he asked that so I could plug my company for free. Um, 
which I'll do really cheaply. I own Mission 6 Nutrition, mission6nutrition.com. There you go. Thank you for that plug. Go ahead. Um, you said your product yes. fatigue? Yes. How? So when you look at the studies on citrulline and you look at the studies on cordyceps, right, um, we sourced a, a, uh, an ingredient called Pico2. It's a unique blend of cordyceps extract. There's really good studies on cordyceps that actually gives you the ability to breathe at higher heart rates, right? As you go deeper, closer to red line, right, as your body inherently gets to its red line level, it will naturally shut down output. However, if you're able to keep your heart rate down as you're getting closer to red line, right, near maximal capacity, you're gonna continue to work. That's the delay of fatigue. You can do more work closer to red line. Make sense? Yeah, I have more questions. There's two specific ingredients, and, and I mean, there's really, no, keep going, but there's two like, specific ingredients, it's the citrulline and cordyceps. The, ci the studies on citrulline are more about aerobic capacity, but that wouldn't enhance ability to work at higher thresholds. Make sense? Yeah. Keep going. I see it, like, you got questions, keep going. Yeah, well, I'm doing a few studies in school right now, and they're trying to figure out what really causes fatigue. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a product that delays fatigue. Okay, so I would love to know what's causing it um, as well, but what we, like, the ingredient profile was based on studies showing these two products delay fatigue based on statistical data, right? We didn't necessarily research why, we just know they work. Right, and then you're putting blends of products that work together, creating that environment. And this was in like a, an aerobic setting, more than anaerobic. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. I, I would love to know why, but I mean, obviously, it's still it's going to be like uh, to some degree build up of byproducts like ammonia, um, you know, like lactate. It, it, there's going to be something in there, right? Um, but it's not something like a carnosine beta alanine response. It's it, we don't even have beta alanine, so. Given you said you're on the road 200 days a year, and obviously everyone's body's different, mm -hmm. what does your workout schedule roughly look like? How do you maintain, obviously, the fitness that you do? That's a really good question. Uh, the question is, being that I'm on the road 200 plus days per year, how do I maintain my physique? What is my workout schedule like? Um, that's actually a really good question, and I'm gonna lump it in. Um, someone asked about stress, okay? So I, for a long time, did CrossFit at a very high level. Um, Three and a half years ago, I was training to compete at the highest level of CrossFit, doing two workouts a day, seven days a week. Um, as I've gotten busier and busier, I now own three companies, um, all of which are, I'm proud to say, are very successful. Um, my demands are huge. You, not only am I on the road, but I'm on the phone from usually 5 a.m. till 8 p.m., right? I'm constantly working with clients, I'm talking. It's very central nervous system intensive. Um, I tried to sustain my CrossFit volume for a very long time. What I found out was I was very tired, my quality of work sucked, my quality of sleep sucked, I lost my sex drive, and my personal life sucked. That's just the truth, right? So then you get in this entrepreneurial environment, and everyone's like, oh, well, that's just what happens when you're an entrepreneur, right? You gotta make those sacrifices. The reality is I was overtraining. So now my routine is that I do powerlifting three days a week, right? I still do the, the movements that are the biggest bang for my buck. I squat, I bench, I dead a lot. I don't do a lot of technical work like power cleans or power snatches because they're very nervous system intensive. I don't want to do the technical work. And then I try to get in some sort of anaerobic or aerobic piece one to two times per week. That's what my routine looks like. So a lot of what I'm looking at now is maintenance. I'm a competitive dude. So I like to see if I can push the limits on my lifting. So within the context of squatting, benching, and deadlifting, I am always trying to lift heavier. Um, and so currently I would categorize what I'm doing as daily undulating periodization. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but the crux of it is powerlifting. Good? Um, so in terms of stress, right, a lot of the reasons that most people here don't see results, they're overstressed. If you think of stress like a glass, we've got like a 14-ounce glass. Everybody wakes up with that glass full to a certain degree. For me, I'm probably filling 13 to 14 with my day-to-day -day life. I have very little that I can add on top before I stop seeing results. But as soon as that stress glass starts to overfill, your body will shut down and go into survival mode. What is survival mode to your body? Hold on to body fat, stop metabolic function, stop performance, stop all of the things that we're looking at by going into the gym. Decrease favorable body composition. So if we're overstressing the body, overtraining, not eating enough, not sleeping enough, 
trying to take on too much work, we're also setting back our physical goals. So some people are like, oh, you're doing too much. Well, sometimes that's appropriate. You have to really look at what your output versus your intake is. How can we offset stress? Sometimes that's caloric intake. Sometimes we simply need to eat more. Sometimes, not, sometimes eating more is not gonna fix it. Sometimes we have to stop doing so much. Sometimes we have to start prioritizing our sleep. Sometimes we have to start, start prioritizing our workouts like I had to do. Pull back on the intensity and the volume. Does that make sense on stress? It's really oversimplified, but I recognize we're running tight on time. Does that make sense on stress? Whoever asked that. Um, metabolic adaptation, that's the biggest one that I want to touch on. And I see somebody asked about sugar alcohols. Um, metabolic adaptation is the biggest thing I see wrong in our society today. Um, in, in most media, we're told, eat less, eat less, eat less. Um, that has resulted in what we've all read about in, in articles where it says, well, you know, you're, you're going to have metabolic damage. Um, and so, you know, we've all heard you're supposed to eat more to lose weight. The problem becomes if we live in this low calorie state for a super long time, our body adapts to living like that. So if we're eating 800, 1,000 calories per day, your body learns to function there. Well, how does it learn to function there? It learns to stop burning fat. It learns to stop burning anything. And it learns to hoard everything, right? Think about it like a bum on the street. How does a bum learn to adapt? It learns how to survive on the street and it learns how to hoard every single thing that comes to it because it knows it's gonna, it has a finite re source of resources. But your body looks at it that way as well. So your body, right, in 800 to 1,000 calories, theoretically it's in a calorie deficit, it should be losing weight, but instead it's adapted to living. Now we have to go through a process known as reverse dieting and that can really suck. I just wrote an article on it. There's three outcomes of a reverse diet. One, you can gain weight. As you start adding calories from a low calorie state, you absolutely can gain weight. But I'm very blunt with my clients that are in a reverse diet state. You did that. Nobody put a gun to your head and said you have to eat 800 calories a day for months and years at a time. You decided to listen to the media, albeit uninformed media, and you made the decision to only consume that amount of calories and do X, Y, Z hours of cardio. Now we have to fix that. You lost the right to lose fat. That's the truth, right? Another option reverse diet is you really don't see any weight fluctuation. And while that's great, I know most people are like, oh, I wish I could lose fat right away. At least you're not gaining weight in the process. The third option is we have hyper responders out there. Those are those lucky people that you start adding calories back in, boom, their weight responds right away. The body's like, oh, I'm finally getting what I need. I can resume metabolic activity. I'm gonna start losing fat. The problem is before we resume, before we get into that reverse diet scenario, before we start fixing metabolic adaptation, we don't know which one you're going to be. But what we do know is you have to get your calories back to normal. Until we get your calories back to a maintenance level, until we restore metabolic function, you will never get the results you want from a dietary process, period. Any questions on that? Um, I don't know if that was one on or if somebody asked that, but I hope that answers that question. Um, okay. What's that? If you're going to be the type to gain, mm -hmm. is that just like a period of time where you'll gain for like months and then mm -hmm. probably... So I'll give you the most, so the question is if you're the type that's going to gain weight, um, is that just a couple months? Is it a year? I'll give you the most extreme case that I've ever worked with. I worked with a woman. We had to reverse diet her. It took 20 months. Um, that's a year and 10 months or a year and eight months is what we went, right? She gained weight the whole time. Mind you, it was very small, right? I think net gain in, 10, in 20 months was nine or 10 pounds. It wasn't a ton, right? But we did it incrementally. We did it really, really small. And my hat's off to her. She was super, super patient with me, right? But we got to that point. We knew her, her metabolism was fixed and we started the downward process. As we started the downward process over the course of now we're 13 months, we're like a pound away from her all-time goal from when she started with me. So I took her 10 pounds higher, and now I've effectively taken her to a net loss to where she's almost where she wanted to be when she hired me. Now, had I never taken her 10 pounds higher, she never would be where she is today. She could have tried every fad under the sun, every cleanse under the sun, every paleo, whole 30, carb cycling, whatever, and it would have actually made her more broken, and it would have prolonged that 20-month period. Does that make sense? The problem is it sucks to go through that, and I get it. Right? It's the worst thing in the world. As somebody that gets people results for a living, I wish I could say to you, hey, I'm gonna snap my fingers and give you results tomorrow. It just doesn't work like that. I would argue 60% of the population today is slightly broken. 
because of the dietary protocols that have been put out there, because of the lack of quantity emphasis on people. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Um, the question, that, that actually translating into calorie spiking, um, basically this was a reference to like a seventh day high calorie or, or non-tracking or, or cheat day of sorts. Um, actually, this is gonna prevent metabolic adaptation to a large degree. So even if you did eat the, you know, I've referenced 500 calories a day, Monday through Saturday, by going really far over on Sunday, you're sending the signal to your body, hey, there is an adequate source of food intake at least once per week, I'm not gonna go into that starvation mode. Um, is this appropriate right off the bat? No, I don't think so. I also think it creates a really poor mental state with food. What happens on, from Monday to Saturday is you start looking forward to that Sunday. All of the social things, all of your mindset around Monday through Saturday start going out the window because all you can wait for is Sunday morning when you get to go have pancakes, Sunday night when you get to have cheesecake, whatever else it may be. Um, so I, I really don't think it's the best way to go about it. Um, I think that there are certain applications to cheat meals and cheat days. Um, but it takes somebody that's very mentally strong um, and you really have to understand the whole context of the person before you get into that. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Um, calorie spiking goes along the same lines as like carb loading. Yeah, so like uh, the question is calorie spiking and carb loading. Um, it's really a stimulation of leptin, right? So we know that any dietary protocol any calorie deficit is going to create a decrease in metabolic hormones. Leptin will downregulate, ghrelin will downregulate, active thyroid conversion from T4 to T3 will downregulate. That's just the facts of living in a calorie deficit. But by taking in more carbohydrates, it will re-stimulate leptin levels. It'll bring that, metab that metabolic activity back up to where it should be, and then you can, can, you can resume your calorie deficit. Make sense? Now, specifically, you know, you ask carb loading, there are studies that show carbohydrates are more impactful on leptin than overall calorie balance. So that's why you start to see high carb days favored more than high calorie days. In terms of performance, mm -hmm. say like marathon runners, mm -hmm. um, they go, say, six days of eating mm -hmm. regular food and then they carb load for the final day. Mm -hmm. In terms of performance, wouldn't that be pretty detrimental because they're not used to having such a high level of carbohydrates to deal with? The, the question is, would that be detrimental to an athlete, say an endurance runner, six days normal carb, one day high carb for a loading principle? Um, a, I would switch that load to a 48 hour load that's a little bit more balanced. I don't think a seventh day one load, it's not gonna give you enough glycogen to run on anyway. Um, you know, glycogen resynthesizes at a 24 to 36 hour rate, so that's really, you would need a 48 hour load for it to really be effective. Um, the other thing you gotta remember is assuming days one through six are not in a calorie deficit, that seventh day is just keeping you in a surplus, you're not gonna get that same leptin spike because leptin's already high. You're not in a calorie deficit Monday through Saturday, so we haven't down-regulated down leptin. You're not gonna get that same spike. What's the benefit or purpose of leptin? Leptin, leptin regula it's a master hormone, it's a master regulator in the body, it regulates all metabolic function. Right? So if you think of like your body as a thermostat, right? we want you at 70, 70 degrees, and you put, that, you put it down to 65, right? in, in it's, or it's 65 degrees outside, rather. Right? Your body fights to heat up the room. Leptin is your ability to heat up the room. Make sense? Um, question on fruit. Um, so fruit, the primary sugar in fruit is uh, fructose. Problem is fructose is stored preferentially in the liver. Fruit will never make you fat. Um, the two times, or the one time I would not choose fruit as a carbohydrate source is post-workout. When you're training, you're depleting muscle glycogen. Um, you want to replenish that muscle glycogen. That's going to come more directly from glucose. Um, however, there's no, I've never seen any substantial amount of fruit when calorie controlled that has made you fat. Um, is it favorable for body composition at high concentrations? Empirically, I can say no. Um, I don't think anyone here is trying to be a bodybuilder, so I'm not even going to go down that road and go super deep. Um, but the myth that fruit is gonna make you fat is just that, it's a myth. Make sense? Did you have a specific question on fruit or? No, I just want somebody to confirm what I always call them. Yeah, um, it's a great source of micronutrients. Again, right, like as we shift towards the food quality spectrum, you know, like you're not trying to be a bodybuilder. You're not trying to get on a stage. Um, there's a health of benefits to, to fruit. High antioxidant value, right? Like high micronutrient value. Um, it wouldn't make it your only source of carbohydrates. Right? I think that at that point you're getting one simple chain of sugars. I think it should be very diverse. I also think that you're not gonna get enough fiber unless you're eating only raspberries. Um, but you know, I think that uh, there's really nothing wrong assuming it's all controlled. I think there's, again, right? it's just, it's just fear mongering in the media. Right? But they have an agenda, they gotta sell you something else. So um, let's see. 
collective, oh, meal timing, pre and post workout. Um, so before you train, for most people, I like to see your, your pre-workout meal. I talked earlier, it's eating something on the way to the gym, it's not really usable fuel. Um, so I like to see it closer to 90, to two, 90 minutes to, to two hours out. Um, it's really more about blood sugar regulation at that point. Um, I like to see a relatively balanced meal, primarily protein carbohydrate. If you're having fat, it should be a super small amount. Um, most people are gonna do well with just proteins and carbohydrates, no added fats. Added fats are gonna delay digestion, they're gonna sit a little heavier in your stomach. You wanna be slightly closer to fasted, that's gonna allow cortisol elevation. Cortisol, as we talked about earlier, allows for mobilization of, proteins car of stored protein, carbs, and fats to help you burn fat. Um, so it's gonna create a positive hormonal environment for you to train in. Um, Post-workout, it's very dependent on what your level, um, what your training age is, what your level of performance is. You're gonna have anywhere from something as simple as a protein shake um, to a protein carbohydrate shake to a high ratio of carbohydrates to protein in your shake. Um, that's gonna depend on who you are. Um, I would say 90% of people should look for some sort of protein carbohydrate within 30 minutes of finishing their training. Um, and that'll be a really general statement. If someone has more specific questions, they can feel free to ask me and I will get that to them. Um, but I know we're running short on time, so I'm trying to, to get through that one. Someone asked me, what about sugar alcohols found in tons of protein shakes? I don't know many protein shakes that, are, that have sugar alcohols. I know a lot of protein bars that have sugar alcohols. Um, I'm assuming that is, do they need to be counted in, carbo in carbohydrate intake? The answer is yes, they do. Um, they may not directly impact your blood sugar. They are still carbohydrates. So if you're in a ketogenic state, maybe you don't count them um, towards your net carbs for ketogenic balance. Um, but in terms of overall carbohydrate intake, you absolutely do. Um, Yeah, last one I think is organic. Um, yeah, so organic is relatively simple. Um, I think that it's because of the laws. I don't think that the same application today is like when it first is like when conversation around it first came out, right? So if you look at like this line right here on the stage, right, this this side could be um, organic. And this side could be non-organic by what we're using in terms of pesticides, fertilizer, et cetera, right? But what's to say that it's not windy this day when I'm, when I'm spraying fertilizers here and it doesn't overspray over here? But by law, I sprayed this side, right, with like no fertilizers, so it's organic. How do you really know it's organic? You don't. So my recommendation has always been if you have the money, right, and it's something that you can afford, buy organic, right? We always wanna buy the highest quality possible. Um, even if there's some risk, and we don't have scientific data that proves that there's risk on fertilizers and pesticides yet, like we don't. It's just not out there empirically. It really hasn't been around, like the conversation hasn't been around long enough for us to show long-term effects. But even if there's some risk, I think we should avoid it if it fits into our budget, right? If it doesn't fit into your budget, don't stress it. it has, I haven't seen an autopsy that says cause of death, not eating non-organic, right? I, just, I haven't seen it happen yet. And, and if someone has, please let me know. Does that make sense? Um, someone else asked organic. Does that, an does that answer the question, or perhaps they had to leave? I'm sorry. There, um, like pesticides and stuff that can be used on organic, it's not just a complete outright. Yeah, I believe that there are. I haven't gone deep enough in the research to know exactly what can categorize organic versus non organic. That would be somebody more in like a clinical setting, registered dietitian. Um, it's not a route that I really wanted to go down. It's not one, truthfully, that, um, that I care enough about. Um, you know, I, I really, I don't have any, even my Olympic athletes, um, you know, we try to eat organic because typically their food is provided for them. And, you know, we, we leave it at that. Uh, my average person, I'm not advocating it for them. They're already spending money on working with me. They're spending money on a trainer. They're spending money on whatever else. Um, you know, I think first let's, let's dial in total quantity of food. Then let's worry about quality. And then from there, if that quality is really good, now let's get organic quality. Um, but I think it's so far down the, down the list towards what the goal is, right? Um, so I think that's usually my hierarchy. Does that help? Yeah. Um, and then the last one is red meat in total quantity. Um, I think that's, again, that's fear-mongering. I actually think that, you know, we talked about the omega-369 profile of chicken. I actually think, um, so the, the fat profile of red meat is favorable compared to chicken. Um, I think that a lot of people think, oh, I'm gonna get really high cholesterol or I'm gonna get, you know, it's too much fat. Um, really, unless you've got like prostate cancer, um, you shouldn't really avoid red meat. Um, we, have, we do have studies that show red meat exacerbates um, and creates an environment for um, certain cancers to thrive in. Um, prostate's on the top of my mind because I have a family member that just was diagnosed with it. Um, but 
you know, there's, I think that most of this is, is very much fear mongering. I don't think it should be your only source of protein, but I don't think there's any protein out there that should be your only source of protein. I think that you should always try to eat a wide variety of foods. So, you know, if you're gonna have red meat twice, then have chicken or turkey once. You know, if you're gonna have eggs once, red meat once, white meat once, I think that's a really good way to go. Try to vary your protein sources, but also try to vary your starches, vary your vegetables. Try to get an array of amino acids taken in. Try to get an array of carbohydrates. Um, then you're really gonna get a complete spectrum of aminos, micros, macros. Everything is gonna be taken in in balance. And at the end of the day, it's all about balance. Does that answer the red meat question? Good. Yeah, of course. And just generally yes. Yes. Like mm -hmm. Yes. Like as far as red meat goes, that's what we hear most about, uh, where like charred red meat is super bad for you versus stir fried is less bad for you, whatever. It's like, here's your thoughts on that. The question is the way it's prepared. Um, in all fairness, I haven't heard that. Um, I, where, where are you reading that? Mm -hmm. Sure, and that's potentially, but I think that would be more on char in and of itself, not relative to red meat being prepared that way. Um, I think it's any meal being using char, right? And that's where they're saying because of the source of that, that there's potential carcinogenic properties. I would agree with that. There's some research out there that, that supports that. I don't think there's enough to truly validate it, um, but I think that there's some that people have tried to prove it. Um, so, but I, I don't think like when it comes down to red meat, the preparation, I've seen any good or bad ways. Um, you know, the same thing with like temperature, right? Like we could argue that all day. Um, I don't think that's as important as a lot of people like to make it out to be. Um, but remember a lot of things are written with agendas too, right? Like I really make it a point that everything I talk about is science backed and evidence based. Um, I spend a lot of time researching on things. If, you know, it, all studies are performed with an agenda. Um, you know, there's, there was a study recently on a supplement called HMB free acid and it, like, it said it would do everything short of curing cancer, right? Like, I mean, it was like the, the golden thing in, in the supplement industry, like when my buddy sent it to me. So I started looking at it and it was funded by a company out of Canada. Well, that company out of Canada happens to be the one company that uses HMB free acid on the market. So of course they're going to make the study look, right? And they set the study up to prove all of these things. So, you know, you look for multiple studies that show that it didn't happen. You know, now you realize it's, it's not truth. So when you start looking into science and you start looking at these things, make sure it's repeated, make sure that it's, it's truly supported. Um, and, and it's actually happened like uh, numerous times, not just one time. Make sense? Um, cool. I think that answered everything. Sorry. I got really quick at the end. Yeah. Oh, alcohol. Um, <laughs> damn, I thought I was going to get away from that. Um, so alcohol is really simple. Like I, I always like to say, we're all adults. We all make our own decisions. You know, I recognize that um, for most people, alcohol fits into their lifestyle. It's, it's not my job to tell you to drink or to not drink, but it is my job to let you know how it's going to affect you. Um, Alcohol delays what's called priority of metabolism. So when you go and you have a drink, your, your body recognizes alcohol as a toxin. Um, proteins and carbohydrates have four calories per gram. Fats have nine calories per gram. Alcohol has seven calories per gram. Your body really doesn't recognize the number seven at all. So it's like, oh my gosh, what is this? Get it out of me. And everything else shuts down while the alcohol metabolism takes place. However, while that's taking place and everything else is shut down, it's creating an environment where that food is then stored as fat. At some point, it has to be metabolized or stored. Instead of being metabolized and used for energy, right, it's actually being stored as fat. Um, so it's not the alcohol in and of itself, it's the food prior to consumption or the food during consumption of the alcohol beverages. So the question then is asked, how do we have alcohol in balance with lifestyle? And the two hacks that I give everybody are simple. Keep it to one night per week, right? And I've not seen one client, when they keep it to one night per week, that cannot have results. So does that mean one drink one night per week or a whole liter one night per week? Um, the results will be no different, as sad as that sounds. I don't care if it's 10 drinks, I don't care if it's one drink. The reality is the calorie difference will be so negligible relative to the impact of one day, excuse me, that it really doesn't matter. It's that window of time that is much more impactful than the overall consumption of the alcohol. Um, the other is don't avoid a lot of, don't consume a lot of dietary fat when consuming alcohol. 
Because if you do get that alcohol metabolized and your body does resume production, does resume metabolizing uh, the food that's there, it needs the faster, the, the items that are faster and easier to metabolize, which are proteins and carbohydrates. Um, fats are slower to digest, as we talked about earlier. Um, so eat lower fat meals around the times that you're drinking. Um, you know, I have several data points to suggest that. And so, you know, based on what I said, people are like, oh, so one, you know, one drink every other night, that can't be that bad, it's just one. It's actually that's that consumption so frequently that is really bad. I would rather see you get like bombed out of your mind on like Saturday night, right? Like not remember the night at all. And I guarantee your results would be better in a seven day window than if you had one drink every other night throughout the course of the week. Um, you know, we could almost chart it, right? If you looked at it, you know, here's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. If you consume alcohol, here on Sunday, what's gonna happen? You're gonna see the scale go down on Monday, and then the scale is gonna come, oh, this marker's dying on me. You're gonna see the scale go back up on Tuesday, you're gonna see it go up again on Wednesday, right? We know this, just I have thousands of data points on it. So if we have alcohol here and it goes down here, and then we have it here, while it's trying to go up, instead of going down the next day, it comes up again, but remember, alcohol consumption here causes weight gain again here, weight gain again there. And then alcohol consumption here causes the weight gain here, and subsequently, again here. You see why we're gaining weight over time with alcohol. Whereas, hey, just get it all in here, right? One night. Whatever happens here, here, and here, no big deal. Because then here, right, we can see the scale go back down and achieve a net loss for the week. And if we start looking at things on seven day windows and we're achieving net loss on seven day windows in a 365 day window, we're seeing weight loss. What if your goal is maintenance and not weight loss? <sighs> <laughs> <Sorry>. Two <laughs> days per week? I can't <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's probably what I would tell you, right? There's probably a way, right? And again, without knowing much about you, there's probably a way we could fit it in more than that, truth be told. Um, it would, it would take an individual application. Um, but it's creating an environment where fat gain is likely, I'll say that. Um, and that's what we would have to circumvent. It definitely would not be an environment where fat loss is likely. Yeah, go for it. Um, would you suggest that all the alcohol, all alcohol is relatively the same, as opposed to a beer, to a wine, to a beer? So empirically, I've actually seen, the question is, is all the alcohol the same from beer to wine to liquor? Um, empirically, I've actually seen beer be the worst. I don't have data as to why. If I had to guess, I would look at like what's already happening internally, metabolically speaking, combined with gluten, right? And when we look at like a lowered metabolic response combined with something like gluten that's not very tolerable by most people, um, it's really creating a gnarly environment. We're seeing more weight gain. Um, again, that's purely conjecture. That's not science-based. Um, that's just, again, what I've seen over time. Uh, you know, I think that the old adage of clear liquors and red wines holds to be fairly true. So, yeah. Can you talk about the effects of diet soda as well? Um, in terms of? In, I mean, are there uh, effects besides, you know, the, the use of aspartame? Um, Question is on diet soda and if there's any effects. Um, I think that the, what the media is trying to say right now is that the sweetener is creating an insulin type response in your body that because your mind senses that something is so sweet that it's actually increasing insulin levels, which is an environment to store, right? Insulin's a storage hormone. Um, I have yet to see that be true in like true peer reviewed literature. Now, the people that support the you know, banning of sweeteners and the people that hate sweeteners and those people, right, and their fear mongering, they're gonna run around and they're gonna publish all these studies and they're gonna tell you it's the worst thing in the world and they're gonna tell you you're gonna die because of it. You know, um, the same thing that I haven't seen in autopsy that says cause of death, you know, um, you know, pesticides. I haven't seen one that says cause of death sweetener from soda. Right? So there's really no studies that show that any sweetener is super bad for you. Um, I would argue there's just as many studies that show that, because um, the two big ones right, are sucralose and stevia, um, there's just as many studies that show the negative effects of sucralose as are stevia. Um, so you got people that jump on either bandwagon, they're going to vigorously support their side of the fence. It's just what people inherently do. Um, the data doesn't support or refute either one. Uh, so my recommendation to clients is don't stress it. So. Moving away from like drinks in general, can you talk a little bit about the best ways to track track your macros, track your calories? I I know my fitness pal is, is a very popular one, but it's also super annoying because you know 
what you're eating isn't really what what you're listing on on my fitness pal uh -huh. it's literally portioned out yeah and it's you know the exact oatmeal box you got it from uh -huh. or whatever what's kind of like the you know you travel a lot i know you probably eyeball it because you've gotten really good at it can you talk just briefly about some of the ways for those of us who are a little bit I don't know, maybe a little lazy to kind of open up my sure. fitness pal three times a day, mark everything you need. Sure. Um, number one, are we good on time? Because we're, since we're already going over, are we good to keep going? Yeah? yeah. One minute, okay. Uh, one minute. So the question is, how do we track, um, how do we loosely track, how do we get away from the um, neuroses provided by something like MyFitnessPal? The reality is MyFitnessPal should be a tool. It should not be one that you plan to use for your whole life, but I would say it's one that you need to use in the beginning to create an environment of tracking. If I told you today that you had to eyeball and it had to be within like a one ounce accuracy, could you do it? The answer is probably... Right, you probably could not as much as you'd like to think so. However, after 60 to 90 days of tracking, I bet you probably could. So if you start thinking of it as a tool, right, where I'm going to build knowledge, I'm gonna learn knowledge so that long term I can have success, I would start reframing it like that. I would argue there's no way to get around tracking initially um, because we're just not born with the inherent ability to eyeball something and know the exact weight or the exact portion size. Um, I also think, like I mentioned earlier, it's a really good tool to create habits, right? So for myself, being on the road a lot, when I'm at home, I work on understanding what my habits are. My breakfast is you know, usually some sort of combo of protein and carbohydrates. My lunch is some sort of combo of protein and carbohydrates. So when I'm on the road, I'm not necessarily concerned about the portion size as much as pairing those food groups together. I know by satiety, right, what I should be eating. And I also do eyeball to, a, to an extent. Um, is it perfect? No. And I would argue that my results from being on the road are not perfect. But they're a lot better than if I didn't have any sort of concept from having previously tracked. And when I'm home, I track vigorously. That makes sense? Through my fitness, Through my fitness pal. Okay. Yep. So, so no fist, you know, No. Hands, you know. No, because our fists are different size. Yeah. Right? That's true. <laughs> but I don't think that the fist size protein correlate. I mean, my fist was this size when I was 118 pounds. Right? Does that mean it's appropriate to me at 190 pounds now? So, I mean, I just don't think those arguments hold up, right? I think they're very simplistic for general, like again, it's, if you take somebody that's overeating and you tell them limit something to the size of their fist, now what have you done? You've created a calorie deficit. But you're not at a point where huge changes have to take place. You're looking for smaller changes to move you closer to a more precise goal. The, 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 the more precision, right, of your goal, the more precision you have to act with. I think there's a good business opportunity to come up with a way where it's like no matter where you are, no matter what food served to you, whether it's the Google cafeteria or the hotel you're staying at, somehow you know the exact makeup of what you're eating. Yeah, there's called a it's a pocket sized food scale. <laughs> they look like little drug dealer scales. Yeah. Maybe that's where they started. Um, but I, I can I can attest I have several high level athletes that travel with pocket sized scales. But there's just a lot of stuff. Sure. So, so I would actually argue, right, like if we were really having this conversation and you were a client of mine, I would tell you that your head is letting it go way deeper than it really is because it takes about five seconds to weigh something. So if you actually pulled that scale out and you put the food on there and it said 10 ounces and you only needed five, cut it in half, boom, start eating. How hard was that? Right. I'm thinking of more like prepared things. Mm -hmm. Like think about like lasagna. It's uh -huh. got meat, it's got sure. carbs, you know, it's got all that stuff. Sure. And just weighing it isn't going to be... So, I mean, and that's where you would use, right? Like you would pull a, a, something like, you know, lasagna from somewhere in my fitness pal, use that same one every single time, okay. right? Choose one serving, it's all done. Okay. And that margin of error is now becomes a constant variable that you're always operating with. Right. Good? I'm getting like a flashing red light, yeah, yeah. so I better stop. Um, <laughs> so, um, thank you guys all for coming in. Everyone that did, everyone that watched, thank you guys for having me out. I hope I answered your questions.